Introducing an all new channel to the JG9 brand, JG9 Subway Surfers. It's the same old NFL content that you love, but with a twist sure to keep you glued to the screen the whole time. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch the first of many videos. And now, on with our feature presentation. This man right here is head coach Sam Weish. And if there's one thing to describe him more so than anything else, it's the fact that he is absolutely a character. There had never been another coach like him before he arrived on the scene, and there probably will never be another coach like him again. The number of stories on this larger-than-life personality, from his outbursts, to his famous You Don't Live in Cleveland speech, to his feud with Jerry Glanville, are too many to note. And I could spend an entire year probably just making videos about the crazy and bizarre career of this AMC champion head coach. However, after he fizzled out in Cincinnati, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, needing a new head coach following a poor 3-13 season for Richard Williamson in 1991, decided that it was a good idea to hire Weich. Heck, he had success with the Bengals. Maybe he could bring some of that over to Tampa. However, what you might not know about Sam Weish's tenure with the Buccaneers is that it almost never happened. Because Weish quit the team and announced that he was walking away from this dysfunctional organization not even three months after taking the job. Sam Weish was no longer going to be the head coach of the Buccaneers, leaving the Bucks to scramble for a brand new head coach in April and making this just about the shortest head coaching tenure in NFL history not counting Bill Belichick's iconic one-day stint with the New York Jets. At least, that's what Weish left a lot of people to believe. Because on April 1st, 1992, Sam Weish, in true Sam Weish fashion, pulled off what might be the craziest, the greatest, and the most iconic April Fool's prank in NFL history. And this is the in-depth story behind that. Before I talk about the prank, we need some context to understand the events leading up to the prank itself so that it makes sense, mainly the quarterback situation. When Weish took the job, the number one question surrounding him was what he was going to do with his quarterback room, and mainly this man right here, Vinny Testaverde, and whether he would be the starter going into the season. After the Buccaneers drafted Testaverde with the first overall pick in the 1987 NFL Draft, with just about everyone considering him to be one of the greatest quarterback prospects of all time, and at the very least, the best since John Elway came out, Testaverde's career with the Bucks had been a massive disappointment, as you can tell from these lowlights. In Testaverde's first five seasons with the team, not only was he 19 and 39 under center, losing more than two out of every three games, but he threw 96 interceptions and just 63 touchdowns meaning that roughly, for every three touchdowns he was throwing, he was throwing five interceptions. That is an abysmal ratio, as was his passer rating of 62.4 and his passer rating of 59 in 1991, which was the lowest amongst all qualified quarterbacks in the league. For some perspective on how bad Testaverde was, from 1987 to 91, there were 24 quarterbacks to throw at least 1,000 passes, including Testaverde. Of those 24 quarterbacks, Testaverde was by far the most turnover prone. His 96 interceptions was the highest total, and his 5.3% interception percentage was by a full percentage point the worst total amongst those guys. He was also second to last in completion percentage by completing just 51% of his passes, only besting Jay Schrader of the Los Angeles Raiders. The potential with Testaverde was there. We all knew it. But time was running out for him to show it. Patience was running thin. Now, Weish was impressed with Testaverde when he arrived. Weish was a former quarterback himself back with the Bengals in the 1960s, and was the head coach of the Bengals when Boomer Esiason was named the MVP of the league. He believed that he could absolutely revitalize Testaverde's career and was highly impressed when he first met with Testaverde in March during camp. As Weish said, I've heard so much about Vinny that, you know, crud. 
I thought maybe he'd run into the goalpost or something like that. But it didn't happen. He negotiated the thing beautifully. This guy is a pretty darn good football player. I don't know where this all comes from. We'll see how much further he goes, but honest to goodness, that's about as quick a pickup of an offense as you'll see. That was almost regular season quality out there. However, despite Weish's optimism about Testaverde, they definitely needed a veteran option back there, and a quality backup, especially since not once in his first five seasons with the team had Testaverde started all 16 games in a season. And with that in mind, they knew just who to turn to. In fact, they were able to turn to a pretty familiar face, none other than Steve DeBerg, as in the man that was with the Buccaneers from 1984 to 87 and was there when Vinny Testaverde got drafted by the team. Now, after DeBerg lost his starting job to Testaverde, with DeBerg's value pretty high and with him wanting some playing time, he got traded to the Kansas City Chiefs, where he looked surprisingly good at times including a 1990 season where he guided the Chiefs to the playoffs by throwing 23 touchdowns and 4 interceptions. However, after the 1991 season, DeBerg was no longer retained, becoming a Plan B free agent. The writing was on the wall. DeBerg was going to be 38 years old, and he was coming off of a postseason where in two starts, he threw for just 111 yards. The Chiefs weren't going anywhere with him, especially after, over the final six weeks of the regular season, he threw five touchdowns and nine interceptions. Plus, the Chiefs had just signed quarterback Dave Craig, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. As Carl Peterson, the president and general manager of the Chiefs, said on DeBerg in the wake of the Dave Craig signing, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have two very veteran quarterbacks competing for the job. Steve has been a very big component of our success in Kansas City, but everybody knew we had to make a conscious decision about our quarterback situation at the end of the year. And as DeBerg said on the Chiefs cutting him to be fair to him, head coach Marty Schottenheimer told me there was basically no way I could make the football team. He told me I wouldn't get a fair shot. I think he was trying to be honest with me. He could have told me what I wanted to hear, but he is in a better position to know the impact on my career, and he was trying to let me know now so I could do something with my career. The bad news for DeBerg was that after some solid years in Kansas City, and maybe the best football of his career, he was a free agent. The good news, though, was that he was still very much a hot commodity, as there were teams looking for a strong veteran presence and a strong backup quarterback. And even though there were some teams vying for his services, including the Phoenix Cardinals, it was clear for DeBerg that he was meant to return to Tampa and do what he tried to do in 1987, mentor Vinny Testaverde and help him out. The reunion made a ton of sense. DeBerg was a member of the San Francisco 49ers in 1979, and Weish was an assistant on that team, so there was familiarity there. There was obvious familiarity with the Tampa area, and he loved Tampa so much that he said that when he was done, he wanted to live and retire in Tampa. And perhaps most importantly, he had a great relationship with Vinny Testaverde. There was no animosity, there were no hard feelings, and there was no misunderstanding whatsoever. Testaverde was the number one guy, and DeBerg was the number two. Testaverde would have a long leash. It was a role that DeBerg embraced. As DeBerg said, to be honest, Vinny has a lot more talent than I do, but there are some things I think I can do to help him get better. There won't be a problem between Vinny and me. I had a good relationship with him. And the feeling was incredibly mutual, to the point where one of the biggest advocates in bringing the bird to Tampa was none other than Vinny Testaverde himself. As Testaverde said when DeBerg was a free agent, I would like it if Steve DeBerg comes back. He is a friend. He can teach me, and he can also play and win if need be. It's not often that you hear a quarterback advocate for the organization to sign another starting quality quarterback, but that was the relationship that Testaverde and DeBerg had. It was incredibly professional, it was incredibly mutual, and it was incredibly strong. 
Heck, at least from everything I could find, the relationship is still strong to this day. As recently as 2022, there were photos of the Berg and Testaverde hanging out together and smiling. So let's make that clear. There was no animosity between anyone whatsoever. Testaverde wanted the Berg there. The Berg wanted to be there to the point where he took less money to do it, and Weish wanted to make it happen too. There's a reason why on March 31st, the Berg signed a two-year deal to come back to Tampa. And if you follow the Buccaneers closely and read the papers and watched the sports news, you knew this. You knew that everyone was happy and cooperative and friendly. But if you were just a casual fan who only pays attention during the season, or even if you weren't a casual fan, but just didn't read the paper on one or two days, you might not have known that. Because if you didn't know any of that background information, then odds are, you might have fallen victim to this. Because on April 1st, 1992, one day after Steve DeBerg officially signed in Tampa to back up Testaverde, tension arose, and Sam Weish had hit his boiling point. And that's when this happened. Hard to believe, I know, but Hugh Culverhouse could be in the market for yet another head coach. The official word's going to come in about 40 minutes, 7 p.m. press conference at One Buck Place, but I did get some early indications of the trouble there. Coach Sam could be heading back to Ohio. Now, perhaps he is coming out. Let's see if we can get Sam to talk. Sam, can you comment about the, about the announcement that's coming up in about 40 minutes? Um, Andy, I don't know you that well, but I, I'm not talking about it right now. I'm just about as mad as I believe I've ever been. We understand it had something to do with the DeBerg and Vinny, is that correct? You bring a guy in like DeBerg, you think he's a good guy, you think Vinny's going to get along with him, everything's going well in this town, then you get two guys squabbling over who's going to take the first snap, who's going to call the plays. I go into Rich McKay, I tell Rich McKay that I'm going to call all the shots, right. and we're cleaning house. I'm getting rid of Vinny Testaverde, I'm getting rid of Steve DeBerg. You can't have both these guys on your team, you may as well get rid of both of them. You know what McKay tells me? He tells me that I can't do that. I'm the head of football operations here. So I was in that conference. Well, I, this town's not big enough for me and Rich McKay. Vinny Testaverde, Steve DeBerg, goodbye. I'm out of here. You'll be going back to, the rumor is, Coach, you'll be going back to Cincinnati. Is that correct? Well, I'll find another job. You know, I'm not worried about that kind of thing. If those guys want to act that way, they can act that way. But I'm not going to be a part of it. I, I got it. I'm sorry. Well, Coach, we'd like to ask you a few more things. If you don't mind, I uh, understand that his family also had a, a problem adjusting to, uh, to life here in the Tampa Bay area. Sam, of course, did a, a one whale of a job out making speeches almost daily. Season tickets have been up, and, uh, and there goes uh, the coach off to Cincinnati. That's right. Sam Weish, after not even three months in the organization, was gone. Now, there are quite a few tells that something about this seems off. First off, the announcement's supposedly coming in 40 minutes, and yet, he's leaving the facility. That's a bit odd. On top of that, it's a big announcement involving the only pro sports team in the region, seeing as the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Tampa Bay Devil Rays did not exist yet. And yet, despite a big announcement coming up, the parking lot is deserted. You would think there would be all these media companies with trucks outside to cover the event. But nope, nothing at all. There's also the incredibly believable notion that one day after signing the Burr, in a move that presumably Weish agreed on, that Weish would storm in the next day and advocate for the Burr to be cut. Plus, wouldn't it make more sense to cut one of the quarterbacks instead of both? However, the acting was legitimately highly convincing. Seriously. If I played that clip on a day that wasn't April Fool's Day, you would probably think that that was real. And the reporter thought it was real too. At least to my understanding, in the eyes of the reporter, this was legit. The news station fed him the information and the rumors, and the reporter was asking legitimate follow-up questions. He genuinely thought that this was real, and if he didn't, then I gotta give props to him too, because this almost feels too good to be acting. But to the concerned Bucks fans who are watching this and freaking out that they lost their head coach before he even coached a game, don't worry. Because shortly after, this happened. Yes, the coach is coming back. Maybe he does have maybe he does have another comment for us. Let's find out. He changed his mind, perhaps. 
April Fools! <laughs> Honestly, this is an amazing prank. It's good, clean fun, everyone's clearly in on it, and it's not mean-spirited in the slightest bit. Especially since everyone was friendly with each other, and considering the background context that all three parties involved in Weish, Testaverde, and DeBerg wanted to be together, and wanted to get something done. Plus, it's completely in character for Weish too. He's a character. He's an oddball. He regularly speaks to the press. Something like this, with no background information whatsoever, seems entirely believable. Weish probably fooled a lot of people in Tampa on this day. And honestly, if you weren't paying attention to the Bucks with insane detail by reading all the newspaper quotes and analyzing every word, I wouldn't blame you if you fell for this. This was just a great job all the way around. The Sam Weish experiment in Tampa Bay wasn't quite as successful as the experiment in Cincinnati, as he was unable to replicate that success, with the team finishing all four seasons from 1992 to 95 with a losing record, never making the playoffs, and with the team going 23 and 41 with three last place finishes in the NFC Central. But at least it started off on quite the bang. Because on April Fool's Day in 1992, Sam Weish let the world know that even though he was with a new team and in a new environment, that he was still the same character that he ever was. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.